I mean, my talk is quite complementary to at least two we heard today, um, related both to technological aspects and, and, and legal aspects. And I will focus today on the, the more political grounds that uh, can explain why we, we do need a, a better open access policy in all our institutions represented here in particular. Um, my, my point will basically be articulated around those two uh, first items you see on the slide. Um, there is no sense to make a transition towards science 2.0 if we've not paved the way uh, beforehand uh, with an open and rich scientific information space. This is what we heard just before the, the break, as a matter of fact. And this space makes sense if it is based upon strong institutional policies and technical infrastructures that support the sustainability of the corresponding information. Um, to show this, I will go through uh, the French context and uh, focus on the current INRIA open access policy. Um, I will discuss very quickly a few issues like series of items which we can elaborate in the discussions to support this policy. And I'll show a few um, nice things we've tried to develop around this policy to make better use of the content, to facilitate the integration of the content into our publication repositories, for instance, and, and see what we can uh, elaborate out of that. Um, the position I have here is that of a scientific advisor for scientific information in INRIA, which means that uh, my role and the role of uh, the INRIA management is to define a scientific information policy for researchers at, at large. And what we want to do is, of course, to provide uh, researchers with access to existing information, existing publication through a subscription policy. We want to provide ways to record the productions of those researchers uh, by means of maintaining and encouraging the use of a publication repository and in the background prepare uh, the way for future applications related to research data at large. And when we speak about research data, we've heard that over the two days, we speak of a variety of objects from laboratory notes to primary sources in the humanities or any kind of database which has been compiled during a research. The main difficulty from the publication point of view is uh, something which is known from everyone here, the huge uh, increase um, in cost uh, concerning subscriptions to journals, um, the difficulties we've had concerning IP policy. I'm not a lawyer, so I would not say it depends, but from the publisher's point of view, you've probably observed how, for instance, Elsevier has changed over the years uh, its, um, its policy concerning the deposit of publications in publication repositories, so we need to somehow play with the context. Um, the development of new technologies, which uh, allows us to foresee a lot of fancy applications related to, uh, to, those, uh, to those materials. And um, from an institutional point of view, I think it's very important, I'll come back to that, and I speak about informational sovereignty. It's very important that an institution has a grasp on the global corpus of production from its researchers publications, research data, in order to, to do some queries on this information, to know the trends uh, within a given institution. And the current situation is such that for publications, the corpus is fragmented across a variety of publishers. If you want to look at all the publication from the Leibniz uh, Gemeinschaft, you've got to go to Springer, to Elsevier, to Wiley, to Taylor and Francis, and to their corresponding uh, corpora. You don't have a single place where you can actually do, for instance, text and data mining. Um, on the content. Um, all those factors have motivated the kind of developments we've had in France, but also in Europe and the world at large. We're not unique in this system, but I want to give this precise example here. In France, we've had since three years now a national uh, open access policy, um, which has been based on this declaration by uh, Geneviève Fiorasso, saying that uh, yeah, la formation scientifique est un bien commun. So, notion of scientific information as a public good that should be available to all. Um, in conjunction to this uh, policy, uh, there's been huge developments to create national infrastructures, 
Technological infrastructures like HAL, which is a national publication repository available for all research institutions and universities, and more political infrastructures like the so-called BSN, Bibliothèque Scientifique Numérique, which is the, the place where all institutions are trying to coordinate their activities in the domain of scientific information. So we've got a national policy which is basically based on the, uh, on the idea that so-called green open access, that is the authors uh, depositing their papers into a, a national repository such as HAL is uh, the priority. We've got a very cautious so-called gold open access, so we, we want to see in which direction the new business models proposed by publishers are going and how we can both allow our uh, researchers to publish in such settings, but also not see our budget explode uh, following the new uh, cost systems, uh, for instance, through article processing charges. And there's a strong uh, ministerial encouragement to explore new models. I speak about some of them uh, with overlay journals. Let me just mention, for instance, that we've got a national infrastructure for journals in social and human sciences, uh, Open Edition, which has developed an interesting open access model whereby all papers are available online at the time of publication, but a package can be paid by librarians, by libraries, research libraries, in order to have cataloging services, in order to have access to other publication forms like EPUB, PDF, and the like. So you've got a combination here, which is amenable, and the money which is received from the libraries goes back entirely to the journals in order for them, for instance, to pay editorial secretary services. Um, a quick word concerning HAL, because I've mentioned that already. I think it's quite unique in Europe to have a national, it's, it's very French in a way, to have a single national repository for publication. Uh, it has started as a mirror to archive. It has become very successful. We've switched to a new, uh, quite nice version in October last year. And it's really uh, now a joint endeavor, both from the CNRS, which initiated this uh, infrastructure, but about other research institutions where in SAM, in the domain of, of medical sciences, INRA, agronomics, and INRIA in the domain of uh, computer science, for instance, are putting all their, all, it's going to be discussed, uh, most of their uh, productions. Um, a little word concerning INRIA, which goes even further than this. Uh, INRIA is a, let us say, medium-sized uh, research institution, a national one with eight uh, research centers. And, a production of roughly 5,000 papers per year. Um, it has issued two years ago a deposit mandate at a national level. I'm going to, to describe that. It has implemented concretely the notion of cautious gold uh, open access policy, and it's, it has contributed to developing new platforms, new services, which I will also describe afterwards. Um, our green open access uh, mandate uh, is quite a simple one. Uh, basically, if you want to see one of your papers appear in the annual report of your team, you need to have it in the publication repository. This is as simple as that. No other control than the, the timing, the annual timing of the, of the reporting. What we've observed already after two years, but a little bit more in terms of encouragement, um, is that it's a real, real added value for our researchers. We see an increased visibility. Uh, we've seen some researchers mentioning uh, RAMs in their Google Scholar profiles after they put a couple of papers there. It's, of course, a benefit for the institution. We've now reached 80% coverage uh, of our full text uh, within IRIA, which allows us to have a real picture of what's going on um, um, within our institution. So, from the point of view of what I was saying, informational sovereignty, we're close to, to, to success here. And of course, this policy has been accompanied by uh, some human resource support. We've got a strong national network of librarians, uh, which is doing in the background quality checking and reaching uh, on the deposits, for instance, uh, checking that the affiliations are correctly associated to the papers in order to do various guides of, of studies on the, on the content. There are a few issues there. Um, first, the first thing is that I would not recommend an institution to declare a deposit mandate without some preparation. Um, 
We've waited until we had already 50% full tax coverage within HAL um, because we started in 2005 with a strong encouraging policy to use the, the national publication repository and thus making all researchers switch to a deposit mandate was quite easy. Um, we want to enlarge the culture of openness, that is we encourage also you, our researchers to put their uh, manuscripts at a very early stage. Um, discussing with colleagues at the European Patent Office recently, I've discovered that they are actually using manuscripts in HAL because they've got a precise time stamping and the, the corresponding sus sustainability uh, requirements to actually, for instance, block uh, patent applications which uh, they receive. So that's also a very important aspect of this, of this policy. We heard about licenses. Um, not being a lawyer, the idea of a license is really to facilitate, to freedify the dissemination of knowledge. And indeed, the only possible choice for researchers is to, to use a CC BY attribution license. It's just a little bit difficult to disseminate that. I mean, potentially, when you're coming from the public domain as a researcher, you say, mm, I don't want a company to take up my, my information. So I would like to have non commercial. I would like people to take my paper as is, so I would like to use the uh, non-derivative extension to the uh, Creative Commons license. So it's very difficult to provide, and we can discuss that, all the arguments to everyone to say, look, make it simple, because this is a, a condition to pull together a variety of information sources at the service of scientific knowledge. Um, authorities, I will not elaborate on that. I spoke about the quality. I think it is essential when you've got the hand on your papers to also make this, this information rich and useful, associating papers systematically as recommended by Horizon 2020 to the corresponding research grants, European but also national research grants, making sure that you associate papers with a precise affiliation scheme at institution, laboratory, or team level allows you to do a lot of things on the content which you could not imagine before, and which you don't have, for instance, in current environments like academia, ResearchGate, and the like. Um, I mentioned about library staff. I will not insist on that. The, the naughty word is probably assessment. As you've understood, the deposit mandate is related to uh, assessment campaigns within INRIA, and in many discussions we have at a, at a national level uh, in the French research community, people are really afraid that institutions are going to control what they're doing uh, through the existence of a national publication repository. The experience within INRIA with people who have been used to uh, actually be visible in such an environment is completely different because it is seen as a support for reporting and not as a tool to uh, uh, survey them in a way. Embargoes, we don't have them. So if you want to know why, you ask during the coffee break because it's recorded, but uh, basically embargoes is not something we've invented as researchers, so it's not part of the policy. An important aspect supporting somehow the French model is central versus decentral. Uh, the experience we've seen also in Germany, in the UK, in many countries is that a lot of manpower has been lost in actually uh, having a lot of micro publication repositories, maintaining them, updating them according to new technologies. Um, the advantage of having a central place with a completely decentralized uh, library network to control the content is that we can make huge technological step at a, at a low cost from a nation point of view. Um, Quick word concerning gold open access is not the topic. It has nothing to do somehow with Science 2.0. Uh, the main uh, points are the first ones. Why are we cautious concerning gold open access? First, because with a, we are a research performing organization, which means that we somehow produce more paper than we consume as opposed to uh, a university environment for, for students. And we've already computed that if we were to switch all the journals for which we've got a subscription into a gold model where we would pay for all our articles with an average of 1,000 euro per paper, which is a, a reasonable one, we would triple our 
scientific information budget. So we cannot accept that, and this is why we're so cautious. And also because we've got a deposit mandate. So when the colleagues are coming to us and say, should I pay some hybrid fee to have my paper open access? And no, put that on HAL. Uh, it will be available to everyone for, at no cost. Um, let me speak now of what we can do from that prior to the deposit. That's the first, uh, the first application. Or in, in complement to uh, the existence of a, of a deposit mandate on HAL. Um, the first thing, I see some French speaking smiling when they see the name of the thing, Grobit. You need to take an English accent and you should not know anything about French. Um, this is a module we've developed over the years that extracts, similar to what we heard before, um, structured information from flat, uh, uh, from flat PDFs. I mentioned a little bit about um, the analytics endeavor to provide search functionalities on top of HAL, and finally, I, I speak about overlay journals quickly. So one minute concerning extractions of information from PDF. This is a slide uh, from Duncan Hull I've seen uh, a, few year, a few days ago, which is an interesting one, um, and uh, following a quote by Michael Kay, uh, which dates back from, uh, I think, 2006, yeah, that's it, um, that transforming uh, a PDF into structured data is like uh, trying to reconstitute the cow from the hamburger. Um, this is an important aspect. When we've got a flat series of PDFs into a publication repository, there's hardly anything you can do with it. The only possibility to go beyond that, as we've heard, is to extract as much information as possible. And this is what uh, we've been developing uh, with these um, growing environment, uh, first starting from some basic metadata extraction. So Grobit has become one of the best modules for extracting title, authors, affiliations, abstracts, keywords, but also for extracting all uh, bibliographical references from a text. Uh, as a matter of fact, this is why you're spammed by ResearchGate, because Grobit is, of course, uh, open source in GitHub, and ResearchGate has been using that since two or three years. So when you receive a spam from ResearchGate saying, oh, your article have been quoted, you know where it comes from. Um, it is based on the precise SD of standardization, so all information are based upon the text encoding initiative uh, format, uh, which allows us to be completely, for instance, interoperable with the, the AL publication repository. And Interestingly, I just wanted to point to that as a service, we've implemented that on the latest version of the, the HAL repository by allowing uh, pre-filling of the forms. So people submitting a PDF on HAL just put the PDF. There is an automatic extraction, which is quite good on title authors and, and the like. And then you just validate the information before uh, the paper is in your repository. So we managed to reduce um, submission time in a publication repository by a factor between two and three, which is quite useful for researchers. Because one of the things our researchers say, I don't have time to spend five minutes to put my paper on HAL. Um, this is the way to, to reply to that. Another application has been to um, apply such a module and many others within uh, the so-called analytics endeavor and HALytics. Uh, as a matter of fact, which is um, an environment which has started in last year and will, will be developed for, for two years to basically implement various scenarios such as um, looking for subjects within a, a, a pool of, a, of publications in the publication repositories, looking at collaboration patterns between institutions, seeing which Keywords, for instance, or topics are being developed in parallel, let us say, in one Leibniz Institute and one laboratory by the CNRS. Um, identified domain overlaps and even more, and this is uh, very important in the domain of, of strategic planning in, in, in science, is to get some insights on new technical or scientific trends that appear uh, within a given sector or within a given institution. I'm not Elaborating on the technical aspects, I want to, give, to, to keep some time here. Um, 
This is the first prototypes we have. It's available online. I can send the link to anyone. As soon as we've got a new version of the prototype, we make it available where we've dumped all the corpus from AL. So something like currently uh, half a million of, uh, of documents uh, from French publications and allow people to actually do any kind of searches on top of that. Each full text is completely uh, indexed uh, by concepts using a named entity recognition and disabiliation module. Don't see how far you see things there. Uh, typical application I've, we've discovered recently is for journalists who do not necessarily understand the meaning of words in an abstract of a scholarly paper, but do have to produce a paper on a given domain that they can actually use that to understand what things are about, because we're pointing, for instance, to Wikipedia uh, entries when they, they do exist there. Um, final example of additional services we have on top of the publication repositories, of course, uh, overlay journals. We heard about that yesterday. Uh, uh, with the talk uh, by Alexander Grossman, um, what we think is that it is possible to heavily reduce the cost of deploying a journal uh, by means of a novelty journal platform, because basically, if you take the usual four stages of publishing a paper in a journal, so registra registrating your paper, disseminating the information, uh, making sure you've got an archival record of your paper and the peer review. The three, the two first and the last one are actually taken into account by a publication repository. I mean, a well-implemented one. So the only thing you have to do, and this is the whole idea of a novelty journal, is to implement a peer review process that takes a paper from the repository, certify it according to a traditional, let us say, peer review process, and then certify it by means of a stamp on the publication repository at the end of the day. So what happens is basically this editorial workflow, a user, an author here, deposits a paper in the repository, it goes through the peer review, and when the, uh, the peer review process is positive, um, the, the author deposits a new version, this is the post peer review uh, manuscript, in the repository, which in turn gets the corresponding stamp. Once you start working with that, and we've been uh, developing that since a little bit more than two years, we now have four journals available on the platform. It makes you think of many interesting things. First, of course, you understand we are, like Alexander said yesterday, in a new paradigm. We are in a paradigm where we publish first and we get the peer review afterwards, so-called post-publication peer review process. And this is not necessarily part of the culture of all scientific fields around. We've discovered that for computer scientists, it's quite obvious. We know that in physics, it's quite obvious as well because they've been um, disseminating manuscripts in archive for a long time. For other domain, let me think of the uh, biological domain in particular, where final results are essential, this is not that obvious. So it's, it may not be applicable to everyone. Um, Still, we can see this as an important paradigm to have a, a better consideration of what our researchers are doing and the necessity to publish independently of the ranking proper. So you've all seen this paper in Nature where uh, less than half of the clinical studies worldwide are actually published. So we lose a lot of information because of all those clinical studies which are not at all available because they've not gone through the peer review process. It would be much better to have them published and then rank them according to some quality criterion. Um, the other aspect is, of course, sustainability. If Springer disappears next month, we may lose a lot of data. If we decouple certification from archiving and we put together some strong uh, infrastructures to ensure that our productions will be maintained in the long run, then we can have a, probably something a little bit neater uh, from the point of view of our expectations. Um, and then when we start thinking uh, about such mechanisms, of course there is a whole bunch of possibilities that we can think of. Open peer review, authors initiatives in, in selecting his own reviewers, if we manage to put the name of the reviewers online, uh, community review, of course, um, 
to, to deploy some Facebook-like environments. So the idea of such a platform is really to have a transition model from traditional journals, because the, the basic mechanism is very close to what we know as journals currently, but going um, into a place where we can experiment much more models there. Um, so <clears throat> as a conclusion, basically, um, it's clear for me that open access is really a part of a wider scientific information concept. It's, to my view, a prerequisite to have a solid basis, a solid open access, open science basis in order to start having new ideas, start, start having visions, start having uh, new technological modules being uh, developed. Um, we've seen um, the importance of publications during my talk. I could have done exactly the same talk concerning data. We've got data journals and we could build up data journals by means of overlay mechanisms as well. There are many things which are in common. It's just that paradoxically to my view, data is easier because data is not yet locked into um, long-standing private initiatives uh, with which we have to, to deal currently as we have with publications. Um, yeah, I could finish that. I thank you, but I just wanted, because I've added these slides um, before we discuss that, do point to this website and uh, give a push to this uh, EU legislation uh, copyright reform. This is quite essential for our domain. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Laurent. Uh, we do have some minutes for questions. Yes, please. Um, yeah, thanks, Mr. Romary, for your presentation. Um, <clears throat> I'm really interested in your open access policy that you have at, at INRIA and the idea to link it to the bibliography. Uh, and I wonder um, what experiences you made uh, with um, concern of um, compliance so um, do all researchers com comply or are there differences uh, concerning to subjects or with concern to, uh, to publishers? So uh, what are your experiences there? Yeah, we've got quite a good compliance. We are moving to 80% full text, like I said. The problem is the 20%. And, um, mainly, this is related to researchers with whom we've not been able to discuss enough, I would say, because they're afraid that they may not be allowed to do so from their publishers. Um, there's sometimes, you've got some fancy ideas in the community. They're afraid that they may be uh, plagiarized if they put their paper in a publication repository. My goodness, they published it, so they wanted someone to read them. Um, there are fancy things and real worries that we need to identify, so we've just I've seen some messages this morning, finalize a questionnaire, a happy questionnaire, so like tongue in cheek, oh, you've just deposited a, a bibliographic record, you've not put the full text, did you have any problem, have you lost the PDF, can we do something for you to engage a dialogue with the researchers? So this is, this is exactly where we need the librarians. I've skipped quickly the mention of a digital curatorship and the need to have new generations of librarians who can speak about such issues like open access to the researchers. So, yes. Another question? I do have one. Uh, you mentioned some advantages of the centralized uh, repository. Um, another one could be that the risk is, in a way, shifted from the researchers uh, to, the, mm. uh, to the archive um, owner or yeah in your case, to the uh, national organization. Have you ever been sued? And is this a way to, in a way, reduce the risk to be sued by the publishers? Mm. That's a very important issue. This is why, for instance, we don't have any embargo in our deposit mandate, because we've got a strong support from the CEO of Inria, who has a kind of standard letter who is is ready to send to any publisher asking us for anything. We've got an experience because in the 10 first years of existence of AL, we actually received two um, requests to, to take out a paper and the uh, CEO of CNRS has answered very politely but saying basically no way, uh, we'll not take this out. And since then we've not heard anything. I think it's very important to show 
sorry, it's a little bit aggressive as a discourse to show teeth in this respect and identify what we do want as researchers or as, as research institutions in the domain of open access and take this as a basis for negotiation but not constantly run after new concepts, new models. So gold open access, we've not invented that. Um, embargoes, we've not invented that. So there are things where we need, we need this and this and this services. So peer review, a novel journal platform can be in the private sector. Science Open is part of the private sector, I don't care. But from the point of view of the, the manuscripts and the content, we need to have that in the secured place.